man, I really wish this intro was like jazz intro, you know, or there was like some sort of like lead up. But I, and I was actually thinking for a second that I was going to do that. Anyway, sorry. Um, do you not have good mouthhorn skills? I Not really. Mouthhorn. Maybe we're going to learn about mouthhorn today. That's, that's I don't know. My, my skills aren't great. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, everyone, thanks for joining um, for another a wonderful edition of Distance Learning with Portland Cocktail Week uh, brought to you by Campari America. We also uh, have some special guests here, uh, Chandler Tomiko. She is joining us from uh, Fort Hood, Texas. Yes, Fort Hood, Texas. Fort Hood, Texas. Um, just a little bit north of Austin. I used to live in Austin, so uh, very big fan. Lots of barbecue. Oh, lots of barbecue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but we're going to learn uh, quite a bit today from Chandler. Chandler is uh, an international chef, um, specifically not a pastry chef, but today we are going to learn some pastry skills, which I'm really excited about. I made mention uh, that I did try to make donuts this weekend. Did not turn out well. Just I'll, I've got the example right here. It's a, yeah. it's a circle, but it's also like a coin. So it's after funny. today, hopefully, uh, we'll, we'll learn some more. Um, <laughs> But Chandler, thanks for thanks for joining. Thanks for putting this together. I'm really excited about this one. Um, you know, I love all of these sessions, but you put so much time and effort into this one, and it's going to be so action packed. So thank you so much. Um, please take it from here, and I'll uh, I'll talk to, to the brands as we go through the the process. Yeah, um, I think we could. Well, first, hello and welcome to everybody in the interwebs that are viewing. Um, I'm excited that y'all are watching. I'm also excited that I get to eat all the things I'm making because I am here by myself today. <laughs> That's the best part. Um, but I did prepare a presentation, if we could start with that, and we'll kind of come back to my camera when we get more things to actually demo. But yes, this is the bitter end. I am Chandler Tomeko. <laughs> Next slide, please. So where are we traveling to? And I'm saying traveling loosely because we're not really traveling. We're just going to be pretending to travel mostly through our palettes, um, but we'll be going through different places such as Catalonia or Catalonia, I think is how it's said in English. Um, forgive me if I do say words that sound incorrect. My brain juggles multiple languages sometimes. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Catalonia, which is in Spain, but if you ask people from there, they don't consider themselves to be Spanish, but they consider themselves to be Catalonian. Uh, we'll be going to Peru. We'll be using Italy and a lot of these things because I am using Italian Amaros because I love them. And y'all will be climbing into my brain, so uh, you should probably serve yourself a stiff, stiff drink before, because it is very well. But yes, next slide, please. Okay, the Amelia Bedelia method. This is one of my favorite things to bring up. This is how I like to build all of my recipes. I became a chef very young. I was about 16 when I started cooking, um, and I realized very quickly that communication is key. And I could not get these books. I don't know. Have you ever read these books, Daniel? I have not. I'm actually, this is the first time I'm seeing it, and I'm loving it. Okay. So if you've never heard of Amelia Bedelia, it's a child's book. And she is a housekeeper that gets given instructions, and she just always gets them wrong, but she's also not wrong. My favorite one growing up was she was told to bake a cake. And one of the first directions was separate the eggs. So she took one egg and put it in the laundry room, and she took the other egg and put it in the living room. And then was very, very confused as to why this cake wasn't working. In this example, she's been asked to dress the turkey, and she literally dresses the turkey. So she's not wrong, but she also is. But it comes back to communicating properly. So if we can go to the next slide, I will tell you all how I do the Amelia Bedelia method. Over explain everything. Never assume that anyone understands what you're saying. The cooking world and the bartending world a lot of crazy terminology and measurements. People are in different countries. So over explain all the time. Think like a child. Um, I like that mainly because it allows you to be more in touch with your senses. If you think of any kid that you know, they're smelling, touching, tasting, hearing everything at all times. And that's my favorite thing about being in the kitchen and behind the bar. So if you think like a child and think that you're talking to a toddler, it'll help you over explain. Um, avoid abbreviations, um, or if you need to use them, have a glossary. So I, for example, know that capital T is tablespoons, lowercase t is teaspoons. But some people don't know. They're just going to see a T and assume one or the other. So if you only have room for an abbreviation, put a little extra page at the end of your recipes or your book or your notes that has an explanation 
of all of those things. Um, never assume, I did bring that up already, but also never assume people have the same tools you do. Like I have a stand mixer today, but I lived a long time without having a stand mixer. So I had to use a hand mixer. And before that, I just had a wooden spoon. So it's really important to not assume that people have the same tools, the same way of measuring. There is the imperial and the metric system um, and terminology. Uh, I use terminology all the time. I've been doing this for too long. So I'll say like mise en place. And a lot of people don't know what that means because mise en place is having all of your things measured and set out, but it's also making sure you have all your tools making sure your oven is preheated. It's basically everything in its place. But that would be me using terminology people don't understand. So I have the choice to over explain it or include a definition in my glossary. And think about the order of your actions. When you're writing up a recipe or getting ready to cook a recipe, read all the way through it and think about it. Sometimes that recipe is going to forget to tell you to preheat your oven and then you've already made everything and your oven's cold. So now it's just sitting there, possibly deteriorating before it gets into the oven. So that is a peek into the Amelia Bedelia method. Dress your turkeys, not in clothes, but with actual ingredients. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna end up sending you one of these books so you can read it. They're very entertaining. Please do, I would love to. I have a lot of time in my hands at home. Oh, yeah. oh my gosh, okay, carquinholis, that is a mouthful. Can you say that word? Carquinholis. Okay, not bad, not bad. Right. So carquinholis are from Catalonia, Spain, and they're very similar to a biscotti. They are usually made with banana set liqueur and they get baked twice, also similar to biscotti. They're usually in, in Catalonia, they're served with like coffee or like a glass of port or something like that. I love these cookies. Um, if you've ever had a biscotti, you've basically had a cappuccino. They're just minorly different because people pronounce it differently, but the cookie itself is just shaped, elongated. It's got little bits and pieces of items in it, whether it's almonds or dried fruits. And I love these cookies for the holidays because they're crunchy. They travel fantastically. So we're actually going to make these and then I'll show you some little gift boxes I put together for cure packages I'm sending out tomorrow. Amazing. So I have included, I think on the following slide, the traditional recipe. If we can pull that up. Beautiful. So this is the traditional recipe and it is almost identical to what I'm going to be making. Um, but the way I wanted to tie in the two cultures was you'll see anisette liqueur. Um, as part of the ingredients, and I wanted to use an Italian Amaro. So today, I'm going to be using Raulio Amaro, Love which I'm super Amaro. pumped about, in place of the anisette liqueur. And then these kind of get like this egg wash that we'll go over in here in a minute. And it's usually just got more of the anisette liqueur. But I wanted to make things a little more complex, so I added in a little bit of limoncello, because I thought limoncello and Raulio paired nicely. And traditionally, carquinholis have almonds, but again, I really wanted to highlight all the flavors that I find when I'm drinking Braulio, so I added in cacao nibs and dried cherries. And that's why those are highlighted right there. Um, I'm also adding clove instead of anise or vanilla, just to kind of, again, accentuate all the flavors that are in Braulio. And the modified recipe is called a 13-hour road trip because that is how long it takes you to get from Catalonia to wherever Braulio is made. <laughs> Borneo. Borneo. Borneo? No. Borneo. Oh, Borneo. I was like, Borneo, I think, is somewhere very different. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we are going to just get into it. Um, for this recipe, if you are preparing this later to follow along, please preheat your ovens. That is the first thing you need to do. Um, 375 Fahrenheit. I uh, don't remember the Celsius conversion off the top of my head, but I can do it for you later. And I know there's ways to do that on the internet very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be using a stand mixer. You can use a hand mixer, just the ones that you hold like this. You can also do this by hand. I've done this by hand a ton, ton of times. But what we're going to do is we're going to add in all of our dry ingredients first. And if you're looking at the recipe, I included grams, which is weight measurements, because it will make your recipe exactly perfect. Because sometimes you'll be a few grams off here and there if you're measuring with an imperfect device, mostly a human. Humans are not perfect. Grams and measurements are. So I did include, however, cups and tablespoons and teaspoons in case you do not have access to a scale, you will still be able to make this recipe. So I'm going to be using... 150 grams of sugar, just white sugar. Put that directly in there. 
And then I'm going to use 230 grams of all-purpose flour, bleached or unbleached, whatever your preference. Um, I have unbleached. And then I'm going to add in the rest of my dry ingredients. So I have three grams of baking powder, two grams of baking soda, and a half teaspoon of clove. And I didn't include a gram measurement for that because ground cloves are incredibly lightweight. You'd have to have a very fine-tuned scale to be able to measure a half teaspoon of cloves. Um, but you can also use other spices. I love cardamom. I know you used cardamom on your donuts or tried to. Tried to. Too much cardamom was not good. But we'll get there. Yeah, we'll, we'll figure out some way to make that work. I love cardamom. But so I have all of my dry ingredients in here. Right? To recap, sugar, flour, baking powder, baking soda, cloves. Five things. So I like to give it just a quick spin. I'm not going to leave this mix around very long. It's just so all of the ingredients are a little bit better distributed inside my mixer. All right. And we're only adding two liquid ingredients. We're adding half of a beaten egg and we're adding a marrow brown yolk. Now, I like to always have a little bit of extra water on the side just because if you're newer to using Amaro liqueurs or spirits, they're intense. <laughs> they can be very, very intense in flavor. So follow the ratios that I've provided. And then if you need extra moisture for your recipe, you can use water. And then if you eat this cookie afterwards and you think, hmm, this totally could have used more Amaro Braulio, then instead of the water, just add some more Braulio. So we have the dry ingredients. I'm going to turn, uh, I'm going to pour in my half of a beaten egg. And then I'm going to pour in my Braulio very slowly. In a minute here, I'll switch to my hand can so y'all can see what's inside my mixer. Um, but the whole purpose of this, you'll see it's very, very small amount of liquid. It's not a whole lot going on here. Um, because these ingredients will soak up this liquid very quickly. And you don't want a sticky, tacky dough. You just want it to come together to where it's moldable. That's the key. So you can put the whole egg in, and then the Braulio and the water are going to determine how moist our dough is going to be. So I have the whole egg, put that in there, and I'm going to turn this on low, and then get y'all on the hand cam here in a minute. Okay. Yeah, hand cam. Oh, no. All right. So I'm going to pour in the brown I mean, I, I feel mean, like you're always more brown the answer, you know? I don't know. <laughs> Um, and just to give everybody a little bit of background on Braulio, Formio, Italy, Northern Italy, right on the Swiss border. So if, you, if you've never tried Braulio, um, the aromas that you're going to get from this, especially something that um, I'm sure you, you, Chandler's going to notice once the cookies are done, um, a lot of juniper goes into Braulio, which is a very unique ingredient for Amari. So this is a, a category called Alpine Amaro. Uh, and the reason for that is it comes from the Alps, obviously, but also the aroma from it, from the juniper, is actually very, very like piney, woodsy. Um, it feels kind of like, you know, an, a huge open field with pine trees everywhere. It's amazing. So um, we actually uh, just did a virtual event last night in New York. Uh, and a pastry chef here made us some cookies with Braulio as well. And it came out beautifully, a lot of like mint and, and that kind of like piney juniper note. So I think, um, especially when when these cookies are done, it's gonna be pretty awesome. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try this recipe out when I actually learn how to do this sort of thing with my dad. Okay, beautiful. I'm gonna put this down for a little bit. Um, so as you could hopefully see on the camera, it starts off really slow and it's like dry. And then as you're adding in the liquid, you get like all these different like crumbs that start to form and the crumbs get bigger and bigger and bigger until you get a dough. Now, what you're looking for, open this up. It's still pretty crumbly, but I can pretty much mold this and it's not sticking to my hands. It feels kind of like Play-Doh, but tastier, I guess. <laughs> I don't know if I can actually feel that with my hands, but it feels tastier. So now that I have this almost set, right, it's pulling apart from the sides of my bowl. It's starting to clump up. Now I'm going to add in my extras, right? For me, this time I'm using cacao nibs. I'm going to put those in there. 
And I'm using about 80 grams, oh no, sorry, 60 grams of cacao nibs and 80 grams of chopped dried cherries. Those in there. So once you have your extras in, whether it's a nut, whether it's other dried fruits, maybe you want to do some zest or some peel of a lemon or an orange. That would also go really nice in there. Um, you can put all of that in here now. This is the place to do it. Also, if you want to, if it makes you feel comfortable, knowing that eggs, raw eggs can contain salmonella, but I know a lot of people like cookie dough. So if you would like to taste your cookie dough now, you can. And then you can see if you want to add a little more clove or any other dry spices. No more liquid. No more liquid, guys. That's like once it's ready to go, you can't add more liquid. So no more amaro braulio. Okay, no. I thought it was just always more braulio. It's not. It's just, okay, fine. It's not. So, sometimes, sometimes <laughs> you have to stop. Sometimes. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate yeah, I'm gonna that. Give it. I'm going to give it like a couple extra paddles just so it'll come together. Beautiful. So this actually looks a lot. I'm going to show you all on the hand camera one more time so you all can see it. But it looks a lot like chocolate chip cookie dough. Oh, yeah. That looks awesome. Right? But it is way better. See, so, did, I'd get in trouble by just eating all the dough and then I wouldn't even uh -huh. make it to the oven. You know, I was that weird kid. I never really liked cookie dough, but my mm. sister did. And mm. she was a monster. She would eat that <laughs> faster than you could figure out she was in the kitchen. <laughs> so what I'm going to do now, if my mixer decides to cooperate, is loosen my bowl. Put this in the sink. So in the recipe, um, you'll see that it says to roll out and shake two logs with the dough. Personally, for me, I like to make smaller logs. So even though the recipe traditionally, you would take this, divide it in half, just kind of make some like Play-Doh style snakes. Um, I like to do four because then it's easier for me to transfer it to like a cookie sheet. So I have my prepared cookie sheet with a parchment paper. You can also use those like silicone pads, those silicone mats that you can put on those. Those are my favorite. I currently don't have any. If anybody wants to send me Christmas gifts, <laughs> but I'm going to turn this out onto a lightly floured surface. So right now I just have my chopping board, mainly so that I don't have to clean my countertop in between making things for you guys. But I'm going to pull this out. And just so you know, if you are making this, you'll end up with like a bunch of dust here in the bottom. Because sometimes your mixer won't grab it all. So you can just kind of press it into the dough and the dough will pick it up. You don't want to leave cacao nibs and cherries in your mixer. No way. No way. Yeah. You want all of that. All of it in there. All right. So I'm going to put this here. Throw my extra dust there. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put just a tiny bit of flour on my hands. And this is one of those things. It's kind of like salt. Start small. You can always add more flour if you need it. If you go too far, then your cookies are going to be really, really dry. So I just kind of like to make sure I can shape this and it's not sticking too terribly much to a lot of different things. So I make like a mini loaf, and then I karate chop it in the middle. That's a professional term. Just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm going to leave that half over here. I'm going to do another karate chop. And now I have two here. And I'll do this one. So now I have four little balls of dough. And you're really not going to like, there's nothing intense or super difficult about rolling this out. You're literally just taking it, shaping it into like a log or like I said, a Play-Doh snake. Um, if you're doing four pieces like mine, um, I don't know, my log's like about six, six inches, give or take. It's not too long. Now, what you want to do is you want to make sure it's only about an inch thick. So if you can see that, it's only not crazy. And that's because when I go to put it on my cookie sheet, I'm going to flatten a little bit. Mm -hmm. And when they cook, they'll spread just a little bit more. And that's how you get those elongated cookies. If you smash it too much, it'll burn and then stay raw in the middle. If you leave it too high, it'll burn and stay raw in the middle. <laughs> so you want them about the thickness of a quarter, give or take. So I'm going to make these little logs and transfer them to my cookie sheet. Got it. That was going to be my next question. If you had to shape it in any particular way, but really it's all about just getting the thickness, right? That's yeah. It's, hard part. 
And I mean, you can actually make these way longer. Like say you want to use these as a garnish or you want something super dramatic and you want cookies that are like this big, then part of that is the way you're going to cut the log, which we'll go into when we get to that step. Mm. Part of it is how long you make it. So if you want really long, dramatic cookies, make a single long log. It's going to be a lot harder to bake, <laughs> but you can do that. Um, I like to make them a little shorter because I'm sending these as gifts so I can cut them in smaller pieces and they can fit better into little care boxes. Got it. That's log number two. And if you wanted to be like super high speed chef about this, um, this, okay. So one of the reasons I'm not a pastry chef <laughs> is because a lot of pastry has to be very exact, right? You can't just like add however much baking powder you want. That's not how baking works. Um, but I like things like this where there's a lot of creative leeway and you can kind of do whatever you want, but it still works because that speaks to the chef in me. Mm. I, so. I think especially for me, uh, my style of bartending is much more like uh, cooking than baking. You mm -hmm. know, I'm more like, yeah, like, let's just you know, work work through it. We'll, we'll make it happen. You know, maybe throw a little bit in at the end here or there. You know, I'm, I'm all about the service. You know, that's that's where I'm really coming into play. I feel that. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I feel like if you give me too much structure, then I start to just freak out and nothing starts to work. So I like in the kitchen, if I'm yes, if there's a recipe, I can follow it. I've created standardized recipes for a lot of the restaurants I've opened. But at the end of the day, like if I'm making it, eh, it needs a little extra black pepper today. Then it does. If I want to add more bacon, it's getting more bacon. I don't care what the recipe says. Mm. Bacon always delicious. Hundred percent. Yeah. I, I just add bacon to pretty much anything, especially breakfast items. I mean, why would you not? All right, so see if I don't drop these on my floor. But yeah, those are my four little logs. Nice. Pretty simple, right? You feel like you can make this? So I could definitely make this, yeah. I mean, okay. no problem. I All think right. I think the next step is where I would probably fall. <laughs> yeah. All right, so the next step. Our next step before we put these into the oven is the egg wash. So this recipe, um, I think on the recipe, I think it said it makes 20 cookies. That's, that's a lie. Like I know I said that, I know what I said, but it's a lie because it's really gonna depend on how you cut your cookies, whether you like them thin, whether you like them thick. So 20 is a ballpark, but it's a really bad ballpark. <laughs> it's a really bad ballpark. But what we're gonna do is because this recipe only used a half egg, I know in the recipe it says take another whole egg, beat it, and then add in some Amaro Braglio for your egg wash. I didn't feel the need to do that because I had a lot of egg left over and large eggs. So I just have the rest of my beaten egg. I'm going to add in some Braglio. And this is the chef in me. There's measurements in there. <laughs> I know that I'm supposed to use a teaspoon and a half, I think, give or take. I'm just yeah. going to in there. Now, the reason we're doing this egg wash is because it helps it stay moist on the outside. It's going to allow it to brown and get really nice and golden, like uniformly. And then it's going to add more Braulio flavor, which is the whole point, right? There it is. Yeah. I knew there was more Braulio. All right. So I have these here. And then it's literally like painting. Just going to brush them. But you want to make sure, I've seen people do this recipe after I give it to them, and they just brush the top. So... <laughs> Make sure you brush all of the exposed parts. Like if you can see it, make sure it's brushed with your egg wash. The sides, the ends, all of it. Uh, we're getting a lot of comments here. People are very, very excited about the cookies. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you're gonna have to send some to Lindsay Johnson. She said that Braulio cookies are exactly what she needs in her life. Well, that, I mean, that can, that can be made to happen. <laughs> oh, we... Brittany, I mean, everybody, everybody needs it. Everybody wants cookies? Yeah. Hey, reach out. We'll find a way to make it happen. I have a lot of free time. It is the pandemic. And I have the cutest gift boxes that I found at the dollar store, which makes them even better, I think, because they only cost a dollar. Yeah. I was always so impressed with the dollar store, everything being a dollar. So crazy. Right? I mean, I would be super happy if I could get, like, a Mara Braulio to be a dollar. Could they start okay, well, let's not get too crazy. I mean, listen, <laughs> you know, we, we can help. We can rush. Yeah, we're just we're just lucky enough to get Braulio in the country at all and enough mm -hmm. to sell, so that's good. That is, that is true. 
I know anytime I've traveled abroad, I always come back and I think, oh, I wish I could get that here. And I never can get the things that I want. So I'm always happy when I can find foreign things in my country that I love. So yeah. super. I'm going to put these in the oven. And then my oven likes to not like me. Um, it's an old oven from the 1970s. It likes to run hot, even though I have a thermometer and I've calibrated it. So the recipe says to bake these for 15 minutes, but I'm going to check it halfway through that to rotate my pan because some of my oven has hot spots. Mm. I'm going to set my timer. How do, you, um, how do you find the hot spots? Is it just like trial and error trying to bake things or is it you just, you, you're just rotating it so that you at some point in time hope that it all evens out? No, okay, so if you've ever made like a cake in your oven, right, just a plain, you, I like to use something that's like light in color, like a vanilla cake. Um, and it can be a box cake, you don't have to go all out and make something fancy. But if you put it in the center of your oven, and then one side of it is browning faster, like one edge, that's your hot spot. And it's probably because depending on the kind of oven you have, whether it's electric, gas, um, those coils or those heating elements are located in different places. <laughs> And older ovens aren't great at distributing that heat. Newer ovens don't usually have that problem. Um, but yeah, if you notice that like when you make cookies, your right row of cookies is like browner than the other ones faster, then you should make a habit of rotating. However, um, every time you open your oven, it loses a little bit of heat. So your cooking time will be a tiny bit longer. Makes sense. Yeah. All right. So we're going to bake those for 15 minutes. And then when they come out, they have to cool for another 10 minutes. And then we gotta bake them again. So I know it sounds really lengthy, but it's really not that hard. Like making the dough itself is fairly simple. Like I said, you can totally make this by hand. Baking is baking. You just kind of have to wait and let it do its thing. Um, and then the slicing is what I really want to get into. But in the meantime, I'll show you some I already have made if you'd like to see them. Oh, let's do that. Yeah. The magic of television. Right, TV magic. So look at these. I found these adorable lunch boxes. <laughs> They're so cute. They even have like a little strap. Oh, that's awesome. Hey, and they have like all these different holiday themes. Yeah, so these, I like mine. I'll just say this before I show them to you. I like my cookies or my carquinolis sliced a little on the thicker side. So I get a really nice crunch and then there's like a soft, chewy middle. You get the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. If you like only crispy cookies, then we're gonna cut them thinner, which I'll show you how to do later. Yeah, so these, are the cookies awesome and so they're about that big they're about that thick yep. and so like depending on what you put in there because you put dried cherries in there depending on what you put in there it might have like a little bit more give right like the cherries are going to give it a little bit of like kind of squishiness absolutely and then like the chocolate even though it's cacao nibs not like baking chocolate right which has a lot more fat added to it they do get a little melty it's still a chocolate product so if you eat these warm out of the oven it is like the best adult chocolate chip cookie you've ever had. Yeah. Um, but when they get cold, it becomes like a cold chocolate chip. It has a crunch, but like dried fruits always have that like give to them, as you're saying, that's that's completely appropriate. If you used only um, like nuts, like the traditional one has chopped almonds, then that cookie is pretty much gonna be crunchy all the way through, unless yeah, you right. do a thicker slice. Yeah, I found that. And then I found this little gift box at the dollar store too. I think this is supposed to be for like gift cards. I think, uh, cause I had like a little insert, but I took it out and then I just lined the inside of the box with parchment paper. And then you have your little gift of cookies. Amazing. So do we have any questions about the cookies yet? Um, we have no questions. We have a lot of requests for them, which it should not be <laughs> shocking to you. I think this is one of those things where when you put something so delicious on the internet and then you even say that you're making Packages like oof, you're getting yourself yeah. in some hot water here. I mean, I mean, I'm a big girl. I know I open that door. <laughs> so um, I perfectly put together because I had everything pre-measured. You'd be amazed how much cleaner your kitchen will be if you just pre-measure all of your things. Now I will say this: my roommates, um, my boyfriend and our roommate, do not appreciate the chef brain pre-measuring things because there's a lot of extra dishes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but they get painting cookies, so it can't be that bad, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean they're not, they're not even the work. Come on, come on. But, I mean, right. I mean, if, if they're doing the dishes, I hope they're doing the dishes. Mm. But um, I, I mean, they are doing the dishes, and I will say, like, even though I had like all these little like ramekins and little finger bowls, 
the ingredients that are in there are usually dry, so they don't usually have to be scrubbed. So I can literally just put them in my dishwasher and good to go. There's not really that many dishes. I think my roommates just like to complain. <laughs> I think they just want more cookies. I think it's a ruse. That's what I think. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's funny because Brittany, I, I have the exact same problem with the apron. And it's usually, it happens to me when I'm like frying bacon or something. Mm -hmm. And then I have like a white shirt on. And then next thing I know, I do not have a white shirt any longer. And it's because I forgot the apron. It's the same thing. Everybody. Yeah. See, like the whole chefs wear white coats thing, that never that never worked for me. Somehow, every time I wear a white coat, it's like, oh, you thought you were going to have a white coat. <laughs> but every time I wear a black coat, yes, I'll get maybe like some sprays of things on me. But not only are they harder to see, but most of the time, for some reason, I just don't seem to get as dirty. I think white as a color on anything just attracts all of the things. I just, yep. it just wants to get dirty. Oh, man. White shoes, that's, they never <sighs> stay white. Never. I've never had a pair of white shoes that lasted more than like two wears without looking trash. 100%. Absolutely not. But so um, while those are in the oven, um, we can talk about our next dessert. Um, we won't make it quite yet, but we will talk about it. So the Suspiro Limeño hails from Peru. It's very, very classic. A lot of people like to say it's the national dessert. I don't know if it's actually been designated as the national dessert. But it's originally called Suspiro, Suspiro de la Limeña, which means the sigh of a Peruvian woman from Lima, which is their capital. So basically, the person that created this recipe ate it and thought it was so delicate and inviting, like the sigh of a beautiful woman, is how the legend goes. And it takes um, like a pudding style base. It's really creamy, similar to dulce de leche. Now, dulce de leche is not all created equal. It depends on what Latin country you're from. Some of them are hyper thick where you can like turn them upside down like a blizzard and they don't come out. <laughs> Others are super, super creamy, like a lightly thicker Alfredo sauce. So there's a lot of room for different thickness depending on what you like. Um, but so this traditional dessert is made with pisco and then it gets a boozy meringue on top of that and it's usually made with port wine. So it's a very interesting combination of port and pisco, absolutely delicious, incredibly rich and heavy, um, just very decadent. And it's one of those things like, you're gonna get one and you're like, oh, it's this small. I know I want more. And then you're gonna eat it and you're gonna be like, I can't handle more. It's, it's a lot. It doesn't look like a lot, but it is. But um, we're gonna be making that with chinar. Am I saying that correctly? Chinar, that's correct. Chinar? So yes, uh, we are going to be making that with Chinar. I thought it was going to be a really interesting little swap. So uh, the traditional recipe, as you can see, it's got vanilla extract and almond extract. I'm replacing that with our spirit. Um, usually, if you're making the traditional boozy version, then you would use pisco there instead of the vanilla and almond. Oh, there's my cookie cutter. <laughs> Beautiful. I'm going to rotate these cookies. Uh, Pisco is one of my favorite spirits. I think it's one of the most underrated. Uh, and Pisco Negronis, I think, need to be a thing that people really get on top of because a delicious Pisco is like the most beautiful, aromatic, almost gin-like ingredient. I, I love that. Just side note, side note. I don't know why it's taking me this long to like consider a Pisco Negroni. That sounds yeah. really good. I love Pisco. I'm a sucker for a good Pisco sour. And I know that's kind of like, blah maybe if you're really into pisco but i love 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 a good pisco sour yeah yeah i i was fortunate enough to go down there and blend some pisco once um down to um uh cusco and and, and check all that out and honestly like you know there's so many different pisco sours down there it's just not oh, yeah. pisco sours everywhere and different infused piscos cacao mm -hmm. or uh coconut coca what what, what coca, leaf. coca leaf like pisco mm -hmm. man so good i like that no i, I didn't i haven't ever heard of the coca leaf infused one. It sounds like it would be great. I had like coca leaf candies. Um, yeah. A colleague of mine went to Peru, brought back a bunch of different products. It was really interesting. My favorite pisco sour I've ever made, had was made for me by, I don't know what the actual term would be, but I like whoever the assistant to the ambassador of Peru, whatever that position is called. Mm. Uh, but they were visiting the embassy when I lived in Costa Rica and I was part of the chef team. And they had some bottle that didn't have a label of some pisco that somebody <laughs> in their hometown made. And they made us a round of pisco sours in like a th gesture of thanks. And it was the best one I've ever had. I'll never have another one like it. Can't recreate it if I wanted to. <laughs> but 
but it was delicious. Oh my gosh, it was so good. Yeah, love it. All right, I'm gonna have Leo, before we move on in the slides, we'll come back to the Suspiro de Domenia. We're gonna go to the hand cam so you can see inside my oven and check out these cookies. Because I want you to know they spread. So, that is what they're uh -huh. doing. They almost look like little loaves of bread. Love it. Right? And see, I want you to like, I don't want anyone to freak out when you're making these at home. Like, they're not supposed to look smooth. They're not supposed to look perfect. This is very rustic. This is a very like countryside dessert. It's not meant to be super polished, but they can look really pretty, but it's mainly in how you cut it and what's in it. So I like that. That, that appeals to me where it's like, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it's going to taste delicious. I'm into so, that. Um, for the traditional suspiro limeño, um, like I said, you use port and pisco. Um, most people will put pisco in the manjar. Manjar would be your pudding base. That's the terminology for it. Um, and then they would put port in the meringue. But some people do pisco on pisco. Some do one and the other. Um, some people leave out pisco or alcohol entirely in the base. I'm not trying to skimp on any of the booze because we came here for boozy desserts. <laughs> so on the next slide, you'll see um, my modification of this recipe. So a Venetian in Peru, um, we're going to be using chinar, which is out of the Venice area or Venetian area of Italy. So that's kind of like kind of like an American in Paris, kind of play on words as I do. I'm a sucker for puns and dad jokes. <laughs> um, so it's it's one of those things where. Um, you're going to be buying ingredients that are already made, right? It's evaporated milk, condensed milk. You could make your own, yes. I've never found it to be entirely necessary or something I want to do because those are both lengthy processes. I'm just trying to make dessert, get it into my mouth, and have fun. So you could make your own. Um, you can also play around with different milks. Um, I did make a vegan version of this one time, and I want to say we use oat milk the evaporated milk and then condensed milk you can actually make something very similar and even buy i think nowadays a condensed like coconut milk i think that's a product that's actually on the market don't ask me where to get it um i'm not a vegan but if you need to know i can reach out to my vegan friends um but it also adds an interesting depth of flavor because you're working with new grains and different things that aren't just milk right you have a light coconut flavor or a light oat and grain flavor so those are really nice um, and then the egg yolks, it's really important. You'll see I have all of mine already cracked in a ramekin. You want to try and break them carefully and keep them separated in their little yolk form, if you will, like the little bubble that is the yolk. Because when we make this, we're gonna try to add them in one at a time. If it's like one and a half, because one of them got smashed, that's fine. But we're trying to add them in one and a half, or one at a time. And then if you'll notice, we're using five egg yolks for the manjar. We're using four egg whites for the meringue. And this has always bothered me about this traditional recipe, that there's just this like egg white left over for no reason whatsoever. So let me tell you that after I became a bartender and discovered a love for egg white cocktails, that is where that other egg white goes every single time. So fear not, that other lonely egg white is not being discarded or wasted. It is being put to very good use in a glass and a cocktail. Um, also worthy of noting, the meringue recipe is very large. Um, this makes a lot of meringue, a lot more than I would ever put on the actual desserts, but when they are made in Peru, it's like half pudding, half meringue. It's, they really love their meringue. I'm not as partial. I think that ratio is a little too high. So I did include the full recipe just in case anyone really wants to make that much meringue. Um, if you have a lot of leftover meringue, I've done the thing where you pipe it out onto a cookie sheet and then you slow bake it on very low in the oven and you make those little meringue kiss style cookies. Um, but I usually make half of that recipe for the manjar recipe that's up on the screen, just so you know. Um, so yeah, those are just kind of like my little go-tos. No, things you should know. Um, you can also, where it says in the meringue, chinar and limoncello, you can use entirely just chinar. Um, I liked the combination. I think the lemon really complements a lot of the notes in the chinar, and it makes the dessert more complex, deeper in flavor. And it, it, I love things when you eat them. I don't know if you can relate to this, Daniel. I love when you eat something or drink something, and you're like, I don't exactly understand what's going on here, but I want more. 
I want another bite. Who doesn't love that? Right? Like, not the kind of stuff where you're like, this is weird. I don't know if I like it. I'm going to keep eating it to find out. More the, I really want to understand what's going on, but I'm loving it, and I'm going to keep coming back. Instead of it just being like, oh, it's just a vanilla cookie. You know, just flat. I don't know. That's yeah. the last thing I can think of, a vanilla cookie. I don't, I feel like, I mean, maybe it's just the industry that we're in, especially, you know, creating things. When you know, I'm eating or drinking something that I haven't had before. And I'm, I'm just trying to discover what it is. You know, every taste is like challenging my senses to be like, what is that? I, I know it. And then, you know, you're going back in your sensory memory and your brain just trying to figure out what okay, well, it, it reminds me of this thing. And I love that. And I think that's like the best part of exploring different foods and, and beverages and stuff. Oh, absolutely. I think my favorite part about combining like a traditional recipe from one place, but then putting in a flavor from an entirely different place is, oh, hold on, checking cookies, checking cookies. Also, everybody get yourself a timer. <laughs> you, you'd be, a, um, it's actually kind of interesting. Um, I'll set timers in the house all the time for when I'm cooking. And then probably about anywhere between three to seven seconds before they go off, I'll like ask how much time is left on my timer. And my boyfriend's like, I don't know how your internal timer is that close. And I was like, 18 years of doing this. That's yeah, how. exactly. <laughs> That's how. Like, you're, my body knows exactly how long certain amounts of time are. Um, so I'm gonna actually gonna give the cookies about an extra minute just because they are a little soft. But it's because I had to rotate, open the oven, so my cook time is longer. But they are looking marvelous. Um, but yeah, I was. I as I was saying, I really love taking a flavor from somewhere and putting it into a traditional dessert from a different area because then it kind of bridges two cultures in a way. Mm -hmm. And if you've traveled to one, you're like, oh, this really reminds me of this one place. And if you haven't been to the other, it makes you really interested in the other place. So I think it's a really cool practice, but yep. we are gonna go on an adventure. I'm gonna take you over to my stove. Oh. Yeah, I'm coming for you. I'm gonna take this whole setup. <laughs> <laughs> We move over to my stove. Nobody pay attention to anything else in my Ooh, kitchen. Nice. This that was a, a very flawless move, by the way. Thank you. Um, this stove is brought to you by the U.S. Army, a 1970 <laughs> house building association. I love it because it's gas, so I'm not complaining. I love having a gas stove. Um, so for the Suspiro Limeño Venetian and Peru variation, we're gonna need two pots. We're gonna use a medium-sized saucepan first. The small one will be for when we're making a syrup to go into the meringue, but it's very simple. We're gonna add in a whole can of condensed milk, just straight into the pot. Yes. This is this is gonna be a weird question, and maybe it's uh, rhetorical. Yeah. Is condensed milk just milk that they evaporate? Like, because there's evaporated milk, there's condensed milk. What what is it? Okay, so um, condensed milk is milk that's been sweetened and then cooked down until it has a certain consistency. Mm. And then fun fact, one of my favorite little things that a lot of people don't know is if you took a can of condensed milk and you put it in what's called a bain-marie, which is just a big pot of water, um, and you let it cook in there, like simmer in this water, the can closed, nothing crazy, it will turn into dulce de leche. Whoa! Yeah. So you just open it, and then it's and then it's ready to eat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the thing uh -huh. is, is like dulce de leche is basically caramelized condensed milk. Traditionally, dulce de leche in Latin countries a lot of the times is made with goat milk, so it has a richer flavor profile. Um, but if you can't find dulce de leche for some reason and you need it, you can literally just take this can, simmer, and it's a long simmer. Like it's got to simmer for like six to eight hours. It's not like mm -hmm. it's not magic, but it does work, and it comes out beautifully beautifully every single time. But yeah. I mean, I love this because, you know, it's I just put it on in the morning and then by the time I'm ready to have dessert, it's cooked, it's ready to go. Yeah, I mean, I've even put it in my slow cooker before um, on high so it'll maintain a simmer and then just leave it there for hours. Huh. So that way I'm not worried about the water evaporating. But yeah, so then I have one can of evaporated milk. Um, and evaporated milk is exactly what it sounds like. They evaporate some of that water off so that it has a thicker consistency, but it's still not as thick. It's not sweetened. Um, it's just two different milks. And if you've ever had evaporated milk, it has an interesting little flavor to it that's very unique. Mm. It tastes like evaporated milk. I don't know a better way to. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna remove these cookies from the oven. Okay. And we're gonna set them over there to cool for at least 10 minutes. 
Start another timer. <laughs> All right. And then um, in here, like all we have is two kinds of milk, right? The evaporated and the condensed. And when it says one can, I honestly don't know if they did the recipe this way because it's the ratios that worked or because you can just buy cans in this size. So the condensed milk usually comes in standard 14 ounce cans and the evaporated milk, I think is like standard 12 ounce cans. Oh. So if for some reason you have a large vat of condensed milk or evaporated milk, then it's 14 ounces and 12 ounces respectfully. And if you go over, if you go under, what are, what are we risking if we do that? Um, so if you're going to go over on anything, I prefer you to go over on the evaporated milk side because you can cook off that water because we're going to cook this until it gets thick. If you go over on the condensed milk side, then what's going to happen is it might end up being too sweet. So it's fixable. You could just add in some more evaporated milk. Um, I've had a pinch where one of my cooks used part of my separated evaporated milk for a different project without permission. And then I was left without any. So I just subbed out regular milk. Um, but I wouldn't use regular milk only. Um, definitely evaporated milk, but in a pinch, if you were like an ounce or two short, or you cooked it a little too long, or you had more condensed milk than you had evaporated milk, you could add in a few splashes of whole milk, preferably, but milk. Hmm. And then um, I can't tell people enough to get a whisk. I don't know, don't get me wrong, I grew up in the South, wooden spoons are king, especially for like discipline. <laughs> but <laughs> if you can imagine that your kitchen tool is an extension of yourself, think about if your hand is a spatula and you're stirring like this, you're only touching a few things at a time. If your hand is a whisk, you have a lot more tactile information. So when you're scraping your pan or stirring, the whisk will tell you where it's sticking much better than a wooden spoon. Love that. So I'm going to sit here and stir. Um, and right now I'm just stirring. It's on a medium to low flame. And right now I'm just stirring to make sure that the condensed milk and the evaporated milk is mixed together. And then once that heat starts to really get in there, it's going to start to bubble and simmer. And you want to make sure you don't leave this alone. It will scorch and burn very quickly because dairy has a lot of fat. And we also have all that sugar from the condensed milk. So this is not like a set it and forget it. This is a stick with it. Um, and you just sit here and stir until it gets thick. Now, I will show y'all how thick it needs to be. That's kind of the key. Um, but in the meantime, why don't you tell us about Chinar? Because that's what I'm using. I would love to do that. Um, this is what I'm good at. Not at the baking stuff. Not at donut. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it, kind of a tasty donut. Anyway, um, so Chinar, just so everybody knows, Chinar, yes, uh, originally created in Venice, Italy in 1952. Uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Angelo Dalle Male. Um, I love Italian names. They're some of my favorite. Um, I mean, Gaspari, Campari, you know, all these uh, amazing, Francesco Poloni created Braulio, um, amazing names. But um, he was kind of like an entrepreneur, philanthropist kind of guy, very artsy. Um, it played heavily into the advertisement world, uh, Italian advertisement, for those that don't know, if you look into the early 1900s, it's some of the most amazing groundbreaking stuff that has ever existed. Uh, the artwork itself, um, you know, is on display at numerous museums, um, MoMA, all over the world, um, and it's kind of the, the laid the groundwork for um, uh, creativity in the future for advertisement. And so Chinar is definitely accredited with that. And I think even the ethos of the product and how it works and how bartenders work with it is the exact same way. Um, it's wild. It's creative. Um, on the on the palate, obviously bitter. Mm -hmm bittersweet, leans more bitter. Um, one of the main things is the artichoke. Everybody always talks about the artichoke and there's a lot of puns. If you like puns, we got we got artichoke puns for days. Um, uh, and it's one of those things that is just, uh, it's so awesome. Um, the artichoke itself is not actually used, um, not the heart, but actually the leaves. So they dry out the leaves and they use the artichoke leaf as the main bittering agent 
in uh, Chinar. Now, there's numerous bittering agents out there, and the whole idea is that it's either a root or a bark or a leaf or something of that nature. Um, and there are exactly 13 ingredients that go into Chinar, one of which being artichoke leaf. Uh, and the other ones I can't tell you because, as we you know talked about earlier, Italians are very good at keeping secrets. Um, and it is uh, a beautiful product. The cool part about it, very low ABV. So uh, 16 and a half percent, which I think is also great for cocktails, because at the end of the day, I think America is one of the only places where we feel like every ingredient has to be like 100 proof. Um, one of the things I love about Chinar is that it is great in almost every cocktail. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. Uh, I have yet to find one cocktail in the world that is not made slightly better with a little bit of chinar in it. Mm. I'm just putting it out there. I mean, you can just think about it. And, you know, the usual the usual conversation is, okay, well, uh, pina coladas, love it, so delicious. Yeah. Bloody Marys, awesome. I mean, brunch for days, we could do all of this. Martini is the one that I've gotten some pushback on. And let me tell you, if you make martinis a traditional way, you throw some orange bitters in there, why not put a couple dashes of chinar in it? Okay, okay, I'm not, I'm not mad at this, like, thought process. I'm sitting here thinking like some of my favorite cocktails that have Amaro's. Um, I love paper planes, like kids love cake. Like I love, love, love paper planes. So now I'm thinking I should probably try it with Chinar. I usually make mine with Averna. I love Averna. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, Chinar sounds really interesting. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think our standard, like when, when we're making um, paper planes with, with all of our brands, we definitely use Averna, but um, it all depends. It's, it's that balance of sweet and bitter, you know, and I think that's why Averna is a really great go-to for most people because it is so approachable. And I think the first Amaro that most people try and actually like is usually Averna because of that. But I think Chinar for the adventurous type and those that are into bitter, uh, I think it's a nice addition for sure. I agree. So you can't tell us like one extra ingredient in Chinar? <laughs> no. Definitely come out. I mean, I can. I have speculated myself, and I will. I will go out on a limb and say that um, I, there's definitely some form of citrus in there. I often think it's it's some form of orange, but again, don't know. And then I think that there's a couple other common bittering agents in there. But and by common, I mean you know either rhubarb root or gentian or you know something like that. But at the end of the day, it's all about the ratios. You know, like. If I, if I give you the 13 ingredients, it would take you forever to figure out what the ratios are. Is it, you know, is it maceration? Is it decoction? Is it percolation? How are the ingredients being extracted? There's a lot of science there. Oh yeah. Like I'm not about to set up an entire distillery in my kitchen. <laughs> um, I think it's, I think it's cool sometimes to look at things that are so complex like Amaro's because then if you listen and talk to different people that try them, no one tastes the same way and you end up getting all of these really interesting tasting notes, which for me as a chef are like indications of what I could pair it with. Like if I'm making a dessert and someone's like, oh, I, I feel and taste citrus. I'm like, okay, let me find a citrus that really pairs with it. Like in this case, I use limoncello. If mm. someone like when I was drinking the Braulio, I was like, oh, I'm really getting like some dark fruit notes. I'm getting like cacao, not like chocolate bar. And mm -hmm. that's why I decided to go with the cacao nibs and cherries. But someone else might really taste, I don't know, orange zest and hazelnuts. So that might have been an interesting combination too. But I think it's interesting to hear how other people taste it because it gives you ideas on what to do with it. Yeah. No, I think, and I also, I, I think most people don't realize that we all have like different sensitivities to things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's just something that how our body works. And especially as your palate changes over the years, um, because it, it does, it really does. Like every, I think they say every seven years, you know, your palate changes um, the shift in some way. And I know that to be true in myself um, in, in the way that I've tasted things over the years. Um, and I think as a chef, I don't know if you've experienced this where, you know, you you know in your mind because it's in there, it's ingrained flavors of things. But then later in life, you're like, actually, I kind of feel like maybe that's not the case anymore. It's happened yeah. to me a couple of times. I mean, I also think like sometimes sometimes it's cool to hear other people or like draw those parallels. But also sometimes if someone says it, now you taste it. Yeah, of course. You know? So like, I can't tell you how many times, like when my, my younger sisters, I have a lot of sisters, uh, but when my younger sisters were eating something, I would be like, 
you don't taste like the chocolate in there, there would be no chocolate in whatever it was they were tasting. And they're like, oh yeah, I totally taste the chocolate. Because a lot of it is suggestion as well. Sure. Well, I actually, um, I had a really cool experience once. Um, I went to a distillery in Alameda, California. If, if you know the place, you, you'll know what I'm talking about. And they set up these really cool um, distillations of random things and you would taste them side by side and you would smell them and you would taste them. You're like, oh, these smell almost identical. One of which was a, um, uh, a mushroom distillate and the other was a Dungeness crab distillate. And these are two completely different things, but they smelled and tasted exactly the same because of the molecular structure and the makeup of those of those things as they went through the distillation process. And it was one of those things that it tested your your mind because you're like, how can an, a mushroom taste like, and it's, it's wild, but it, until they tell you at the end what it is, you're like, oh man, I had no clue. No. Yeah, no, that's that's cool. That sounds really neat. I like that. Yeah. Um. So we're gonna see. I don't know. It looks on my phone like my hand cam isn't working. But if the camera dude wants to bring it up, we'll see if the hand cam is working. Um. <laughs> yes. Okay. Cool. So the hand cam. I think it might be a little too pale in here, but it is a thick white cream. I'm trying to find the right lighting. There we go. That's a little bit better. So it starts to bubble and I don't know if you've ever had milk in a pot, but it likes to explode and go all over your stove all of the time. Mm. So low and slow is good. What you're usually going to try and do is cook this back to the consistency of the condensed milk, right? Cause we watered it down with that evaporated milk. We want to condense those flavors in there. Um, and that's the first consistency you're looking for. Now, that being said, it kind of depends on how thick you want your pudding to be. I'll show you some that I made the other day. Those are really, really thick. Um, I like them to have that thickness. I like it to sit on my palate longer. Um, if you like a thinner pudding, then you're probably going to cook it to about here, which is right around the time it started to froth. And then we're going to add in the egg yolk. So I'm going to make this one just a little bit thinner than I did the other one. But as you can see, I hope it's mm -hmm. bubbling. And for some reason, I know we've been talking about things that smell similar and like crazy. This right now to me smells like box mac and cheese. <laughs> and I think it's, it's just totally that good. it's like that cheese packet smell when it hits the milk. Um, I know that sounds absolutely insane. But no, is, no, no. But I mean, also, did anybody ever put hot dogs in their mac and cheese? Oh, my <laughs> gosh. Really right? Do you eat it any other way? Like, <laughs> even as an adult, hot dogs, I may be dressing up with some black pepper. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you're kind of making a really classy cacho e pepe out of a box. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. You're right. Yeah. I also love making Mexican mac and cheese is what I like to call it. So I add in like a taco seasoning packet, some avocado, some chorizo Whoa. and some pico de gallo. And it is mud, but still box mac and cheese. I'm not even making mac and cheese sauce. I just add yeah. in a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Uh, we did an experiment the other night where we made ramen and we took um, like a, a pre-packaged ramen and, you know, dressed it up a little bit. And then we also like made a ramen obviously made um the broth and everything and i gotta tell you i mean i kind of kind of like the prepackaged stuff yeah no I've, I, I mean for me being a chef uh, one of the things that i hated doing getting off of work was cooking more like i love what i do but at the end of the day i was like there's no one here to cook for me i don't want to cook i've been cooking for 18 hours let me tell you instant ramen and instant mac and cheese are part of my love language <laughs> i adore them but yes okay we're gonna add in our egg yolks so when you're doing this, um, you have a couple options. There is a technique called tempering, which would be where you take a little of the hot liquid, whisk it into your eggs on the side, which I have my little egg yolks here, and then pour those back into the pot. That's a really good method. It's foolproof in the sense that you're not gonna curdle the eggs if this is too hot. Um, that's not the traditional way of making this, but it's a really cool little technique to help you avoid any problems. Um, I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to do the traditional method so you can see that it can be done. And what you should do is turn this on a little bit lower than it already was. So I've already lowered the heat on my pot to a low, not a medium low. And I'm going to put in one egg at a time as much as possible or one egg yolk at a time. And then whisk, 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 whisk until it's all incorporated. And then do another one. And then do another one until I'm done. So I'm going to go one egg yolk, pop it in there, and then whisk, 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 whisk. We got that. And now I can't see any part of it, so I'm gonna add in another one. 
Whisk, 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 whisk. What happens if you accidentally put in two? Is it okay? Uh, just whisk longer. Okay. Uh, if you do put in two, I've had that happen before. It's not that big of a deal. The reason you want to do it one at a time is because it's easier to break it up. And you're just kind of worried about it being really high heat and curdling and cooking that egg. We're not trying to make scrambled egg pudding. Yeah. Make yeah. Thick pudding. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you are concerned that you might not have like the ability to do one at a time, you can either do the tempering method or you can also put your pot on way lower than it needs to be. You could do this off the heat if you wanted to, whisk them all in, and then come back to it and put it back on the fire to thicken. That also works. So put that one in. And then once we have these in, I'm almost done. I've got two or one and a half egg yolks. One of them busted. So mm. once we have these all in, I'm going to go ahead and put the rest of those in. Then we're going to cook it on low until it gets thick and creamy. And then just to be on the safe side, I like to strain it. That way, if there were any parts of the egg that curdled, they don't end up in your pudding, and your pudding is really nice and smooth. So, like, I can tell, for example, here, there's a little bit of the egg that cooked before it went in, and that's because I had these cracked and ready for the class. Mm -hmm. So they had that thing where they got that film on them from just sitting in the open air. So that's not a problem. I'm going to strain that out. Things like this happen all the time. Got it. Yeah, I think the, the home cook would, would see that and just be like, ah, exactly. oh, I've ruined it. It's done. Exactly. Yep. Got to throw the whole thing out. Yeah. Don't throw the baby out with the bath water. It is fixable. <laughs> That's why I love desserts like this. Everything, for the most part, can be fixable. Unless you do what I did uh, the first time I was making this last week where I scorched my pan and had to soak it for three days. And you can't fix scorched milk. It tastes terrible. Oof. Luckily, I hadn't done the eggs yet. I literally just managed to scorch <laughs> evaporated milk. Well, this has definitely given me uh, more hope for my uh, my career as a pastry chef in the future. I mean, I don't I don't know if I would go that far yet. Maybe try donuts. <laughs> maybe, maybe wait until you try donuts again. But I'm gonna bring y'all back over here, and we are gonna slice some cookies in the meantime. So our little cookie logs have come out of the oven. And they're firm, but they're still soft. They're like a chewy chocolate chip cookie. So I'm gonna put it on my chopping board and get a knife. I'm keeping an eye on my pudding. And then what you wanna do is if you have this and you cut it straight across, then they're going to be the same width as your log. If you cut them at an angle, they'll get longer. So I'm gonna show you cutting one log one way and another log a different way. So this one, if I cut it straight, this is also really good with a serrated knife because you want to cut it soft and slow so you, the cookies are soft in the middle. You don't want to push down and squash them more than you need to. So I'm just going to slice through. I'm making these ones a little thinner than the ones I showed you all in the box. These are about a little more than a quarter inch thick, not quite half an inch. But I'm going to slice this whole log just like that, straight across. And I'll come back with the hand cam and show you what those look like. I'm gonna grab another log, and we're gonna do this one diagonally. Making sure we don't scorch that pudding. So when I say diagonally, that first piece you cut is gonna kind of be a one-off. That's kind of like the one for the chef, the rest for everybody else, because it's gonna be like a thick wedge. So. I'll show you what that means. So if this is my log and I've cut this piece off to get that uh -huh. angle, this is a lot thicker than the rest of the cookies are gonna be. So this one's gonna cook a little bit differently, but that's my own personal little snack. So mm. that's for me. So then you just want to follow that diagonal line you made and then your cookies are going to be diagonal, least shaped and longer or more dramatic. Yeah, see, this is where I would need to do like a double batch because I would probably eat um, one, at least one whole log in the yeah. process. I've I've made I think four or five batches of these this week because <laughs> I kept coming back to them and I was like, I'm supposed to have some to show on camera. I know. I know. <laughs> so let's see, the pudding is cooking on low. Let me see if I can get this hand cam back up. Um, let's see. 
I think I have to re-enter the studio. I'm really bad at technology, guys. This is this is a lot. This year has has been a lot of learning as far as technology goes. Sure. All right. And cam is in. Okay, so this is the one that I cut straight across, right? So these cookies are not diagonal, but they are still fairly large. And then these ones, as you can see, are diagonal. So they're going to be longer and more dramatic. See the difference? Mm-hmm. See there. So it's all about personal preference. They all pack well. Like I said, I cut these a little bit thinner. But now that these are cut, I'm going to lay them out like that on my cookie sheet and then bake them for another 10 to 15 minutes. Oh, did I do this? There we go. <laughs> Let me get that angle right for you guys. Sorry. <laughs> so yeah, short and straight across or long, dramatic, and diagonal. It's just personal preference. Um, quite honestly, they take about the same amount of time to cook because right here, this part is soft. I don't know if y'all can tell that it's got give. But that part is the part that you're going to cook. So when you say the recipe, say like 10 minutes, that 10 minutes is going to be your personal preference. If you like a really crispy cookie, you want it to be nice and golden and really firm in the middle. If you like a chewier cookie, you're just going to let it get lightly golden, but still have a little bit of flexibility. I like them on the crispier side because they travel better, but that's also why I kept them thicker. So they're a little chewy in the middle. Love it. I like the diagonal ones. I don't know. They're just I do too. I think they just look good. They look yeah. so much you also sometimes, um, I feel like when you cut them diagonally, you usually get a better ratio of like all the little extra things you added in there. Um, like the little cherries and the nuts because you have more surface space to see them in. But all right, so I'm gonna put these off to the side. Um, I will bake a few of them for you guys now and then I'll bake the rest of my logs later because I already have a bunch that are already cooked. Um, and that's also kind of the nice thing, like this is a cookie that you can interrupt. Um, so like these logs were cooling for much more than 10 minutes um, and that's fine. I can slice them and bake them at any point. So if I had to like run to the grocery store or jump on a Zoom call and I didn't have enough time to finish baking, then I can come back and slice them and then bake them later. Love it. So yeah, very flexible little recipe. So yeah, I have these set up as cookies now and I'm going to put them back in my oven for about 10 minutes and then we are going to go back to the stove and what we're going to do I'm going to kind of just run through the next things a little bit quicker because I have a video of how they were made so I'm going to show you some parts but then we're just going to watch the video on how it was done um, so we have to make a boozy meringue now there's a lot of different kinds of meringue. This particular meringue is one that we're making a syrup for and then putting it into egg whites that get whipped. Um, so within the video, we're not gonna queue it up yet, but when we do, um, it'll show you how the egg whites start to froth and build and grow, and then what stiff peaks mean, and we'll go over that, and then when to put that syrup in. But we're gonna go learn how to make the syrup because that's not in the video. So back to you. <laughs> Okay. As you can see, our pudding is getting really nice and thick. It's starting to coat the walls of the pot really nicely. And like I said, this is one of those things you can cook it to whatever like thickness you prefer. Um, just keep in mind that the thickness it has now and when it cools will be thicker. So if you think you're already close, take it off and it'll cool perfectly. If you think you want it, I don't know, twice as thick as this, then cook it a little more before you let it cool. Hmm. So I'm gonna put this over here. Oh, actually, I totally forgot. The other thing we were supposed to put in here is the chinar. Oh, yeah. I totally forgot. You do that when you're doing the eggs, you can do it when you're thickening the pudding. Um, it can really go in at any point. Um, it's not gonna really affect the flavor or consistency all that much, because again, you're just gonna cook it until you get the thickness that you desire. All right, so I have that over there. Then I'm going to put this little pot over here to make our syrup for our egg whites. Now to make this syrup, I'm putting in a half cup of sugar, putting in a quarter cup of chinar, I'm putting in two tablespoons of limoncello and two tablespoons of water. And you can feel free to play with those ratios however you like. If you don't want to do water, if you want to add just chinar, again, whisk, 
tactile information is important. Um, and this is just gonna go on low um, until the sugar is dissolved. You don't have to cook this to any particular temperature. You're just trying to dissolve all the sugar. So for me, when I'm making this, what I usually do is I'll have this syrup cooking and then I'll have my egg whites in my mixer and they'll be mixing until they reach stiff peaks. And usually by the time the stiff peaks have been reached and the syrup is ready, kind of coincide. Um, but what stiff peaks mean before we cue that video, if you've ever whisked whipped cream or sorry, heavy cream, um, it's not whipped yet <laughs> if it doesn't have peaks. So, Heavy cream or egg whites, there's different uh, levels of thickness that it acquires, right? So a soft peak means that like when you pull that whisk out like that, the peak just folds all the way over. That little peak at the very tip of your thing just folds all the way over. Medium peak is like, it'll do this. It's just kind of like, eh, kind of a little sad. But if it stands at attention, then that is stiff peaks. And usually when you have stiff peaks, if you're whisking and then you just lift up like in a stand mixer, you'll either see it strung together and hold its shape like it is in my video, or if your mixer is really tall, mine's kind of stubby and short, it'll pull up and then that peak on the bottom will also stay really stiff. So if we could get that video, in the video you'll see the egg whites being mixed and then the syrup gets poured in later. But yeah, it's, it's not a super complicated process. Um, and then the important part is like here you'll see this is a half recipe in the video. Um, I'm currently making syrup for a full recipe, but this is two egg whites um, and then my syrup's already ready in a pot. So I'm just whisking it. You'll see them get frothy and this is on a medium to high speed. And as they continue to whisk, they get thicker. The bubbles get smaller. It'll get glossier in the way that it looks. Have you ever made a meringue, Daniel? I've never made a meringue. Really? No. I've made whipped cream. Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Have you that's made whipped cream with an Amaro in it? Because that's really tasty. Oh, I don't think I've ever made it. Uh, I've definitely had it before. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's really a lot of ways to play with Amaro in food. And oh, they're that, really hard. Especially in dessert, but I mean, in almost everything, which is awesome. Yeah. I mean, like you said, you have yet to find a recipe that isn't good with Chinar. I'm pretty sure you could plug and play a lot of these other spirits that we're using too. I would agree. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know that I would ever go as far as to say that Chinar goes in, could go in any food recipe. Uh, I don't know That's if like my omelet and Chinar would be good, but I don't know. Maybe I haven't tried it. I haven't tried it. That's fair. You know what? Now, now that you said that, I'm just like in my brain, all I want to do is try to make a Chinar Alfredo. Ooh. I don't know why, but I, I want to try it. I love that. Okay. I mean, it could be terrible. So there you see, I have a tiny little peak and how it's standing at attention. Mm -hmm. That is a stiff peak. So that tells me I can go ahead and put my syrup in, which is what I am doing right there in the video. And then I just add that in and it continues to whisk. And we'll see in the video that as soon as like all of the syrup, you want to add in the syrup slowly. But once you've added in the syrup, you are going to be able to whisk it faster. And then you're basically just gonna whisk it until it gets the consistency that you like. I prefer a softer meringue. Other people prefer really stiff meringues that you can like dust sugar on and like brulee with a little torch. I like it to be kind of creamy on creamy, just different textures of creamy. But you'll mm. see it's supposed to look a little glossy, almost like a wet look. Um, and it'll look really consistent. And I've speeded up the mixer here just to whip it all into shape. Also, I'm not a very patient person, hence another reason <laughs> I'm not a pastry chef. But once you have that, I'm going to pull out some of these. We're going to finish the video and then I'll show you some more that I've prepared. But yeah, so that is the ring. You see now it sticks together because it's nice and thick. It's got that syrup in there oh. and it came together very, very nicely. So let me show you what it looks like when you finish it. So when you have your pudding and you've strained it, I love double walled coffee glasses. So I put mine into one of those. Nice. And then I also have another one somewhere where I repurposed a yogurt jar. 
And this is a hefty portion. Uh, this portion right here is I think five ounces. I would probably make these three ounce serves if I was not trying to indulge my pandemic needs by myself in my house, because <laughs> this is very rich. And then when you have your meringue, you just spoon it on top. So you have this nice little white layer here. And then you get to eat it. Oh, see, now I'm jealous. I just have this subpar donut thing that I'll eat. Oh my gosh, it's so good. <laughs> it's really, it's really so dry. Good. This is awful. I'm so jealous. Oh, you should be. My mouth is. <laughs> mm. Now, um, love the bitterness. How bitter is it? So it comes through, but in a way that's really pleasant. It's, um, I think because we're using this, this recipe has so much sugar in it, right? This is a very high sugar recipe. It's got the condensed milk, it's got the added sugar in the meringue, and then chinar has, um, sugar in it. It is a liqueur. Mm. So the sweetness level though, surprisingly, isn't what hits you first. You get hit with this really complex flavor, definitely getting that first bitter note that I get if I was just taking a shot of straight chinar, but then it gets deep and more complex. And then as the lemon comes into play with the meringue, it just kind of bounces all over the place. And the sweet is always there, but it's rich. It's not like a sugar cookie. It's more like uh, like jam, you know how like mm. jam has a different sugar kind of flavor than fresh fruit. It's like rich and dark and jammy. It's delicious. Yep. When things are really good, I end up like not being able to use my words properly to describe them anymore. <laughs> I've lost I the totally ability. But yes. I can't use my words because I'm just jealous because that's the only word that I can think of right now. Well, I mean, this one you will have to make yourself. This one doesn't travel. This one is the stay at home and indulge yourself uh, recipe for sure. But well, I got time. Let me get the recipe. Oh, Brittany's on her way over to you. Look at this. Oh, heard that. Heard that. Uh, so you do have to go to the visitor center on the military base to get a pass, but it shouldn't be a problem. Just let me know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but before we wrap up, I know we have already hit over an hour. Um, I hope everybody's still tuning in and enjoying this because this is how my brain works. But I wanted to discuss how to take a dessert idea and then turn it into a cocktail. So it's something I call reverse engineering. Um, so reverse engineering a dessert. Let's say we were reverse engineering the suspiro limeño that I just made. That is a dish that inspires you. Let's just say that. And then you find boozy parallels or you can create infusions. So in this case, it, we know that the recipe traditionally has like pisco and port. So those could be our boozy parallels. Oh, cookies. For that. And then, um, Obviously, there's other ingredients in there because we have the condensed milk, we have the evaporated milk, so we probably need to add a creamy component to a cocktail, whether it's a cream liqueur or heavy cream or milk. And then you want to take into account aspects such as texture and aroma and appearance. This particular dessert isn't incredibly intense on aroma, but the texture is really rich and velvety. So you don't want a cocktail that's really thin and watery if it's supposed to represent this dessert. And then appearance, if this dessert is traditionally maybe light in color, or maybe it's really dark in color, or maybe it's speckled, you want to try and find a way to garnish or repeat those colors or those kinds of aspects into your cocktail. And try every single weird idea you have, because I guarantee you, if you don't try it, you'll never know how good it could be, which is how we get into <laughs> the cocktail that I reverse engineered. Um, I'm going to take these cookies out so they don't burn. Put them over here to the side. So, oh, we have reached my murder board. This is my favorite. Um, if anyone knows me at all, I have a huge affinity to like true crime and detective shows and all kinds of crazy movies. So this is a really complicated board. This is what it's like to be inside my brain, guys. So um, if you see, I have three things circled in red, but they're all attached with red strings. So I have Hannibal Lecter, the character from Silence of the Lambs and the Hannibal series. Then I have Sanguinaccio Dolce, which is a very traditional dessert in Italy, like really, really old school. And then I have Quid Pro Quo, which ended up being the name of this cocktail. And it's also a line from Silence of the Lambs. So I'm not going to go into great detail here, but the way this kind of worked was I wanted to take a dessert make it into a cocktail. So I decided to start with something called Sanguinaccio Dolce, which translates as sweet blood. So it is a pudding with a ton of really interesting flavors made in Italy hundreds of years ago, 
but they thickened it with pig's blood, which is not necessarily the way we would do things today. We would use flour or a starch or eggs. So on my left, I'm assuming y'all's left as well, we have the whole column of sanguinaccia dolce ingredients. So it usually has walnuts or almonds. It has chocolate, like baking chocolate. It has spices that can range on, the, depending on the region that it's made in, from cardamom to cinnamon to allspice. It has orange, primarily the orange peel, vin cotto, which is a reduced wine must, which is what's left over after you press the grapes for wine. And again, pig's blood was the primary thickening agent. It has sugar, it has milk or almond milk, pine nuts, and vanilla. So what I decided to do to try to convert this into a cocktail was amaretto or almonds and walnuts. There's a lot of liqueurs on the market. I chose to go with amaretto. The chocolate, I'm bringing it in with creme de cacao. I'm also using some grated chocolate. The spices, I decided to infuse into a whiskey. And I thought it would be nice because whiskey has a lot of depth and some added sweetness from being in a barrel and all of those elements that I thought would make the dessert cocktail more complex. The orange, I'm using zest as a garnish. Vincotto, I'm using as is. Vincotto is really hard to mimic. It has kind of a balsamic fruitiness to it because it's cooked wine must. So mm -hmm. it has all those notes of red wine, that fruity note comes through, but because it's also been cooked and altered, it has some of that pungency that you would expect in a balsamic vinegar. And then pig's blood, I'm not putting pig's blood in a cocktail, guys. I'm wild <laughs> and crazy, but not that crazy. Also, I don't know where to get that near my, like where I live. So I'm gonna yeah. garnish yeah. with prosciutto, also because prosciutto is tasty and sweet and salty are a great combo. And then the sugar um, aspect is coming in the sorts of using liqueurs, such as the creme de cacao. Um, I'm scalding the milk that I'm using for this. Scalding the milk denatures the proteins in the milk, leading to a fluffier cocktail, but it also makes the milk taste a little bit sweet. And then um, I'm using milk, obviously, instead of just regular milk or almond milk. And then the pine nuts and vanilla were also part of the infusion that I put into the whiskey. So this is the infusion. I used Wild Turkey 101. And I'm gonna pull up those ingredients. So I, I think it says, yes, steep for no more than 75 hours. I know that seems insane. It's like a really long infusion time, but I don't know. I tasted it, you know, at like 12 hours, 36 hours and so forth. And I thought 75 was my sweet spot. You could let it do longer. You could let it do less. You could double up on the amount of things you're infusing with maybe to decrease that time. This is just what I came up with. This is a guideline, but feel free to infuse it with anything you want, however long you want. And then we can go to the next slide to make this cocktail. So the quid pro quo cocktail, we are going to use one ounce of our wild turkey infusion. And then a quarter ounce of creme cacao, creme de cacao. I'm using the clear. You can also get it in the brown format. Um, I prefer the color from this to really be as natural as possible so that the tones and the colors that we do get in the final product are coming from the right ingredients, at least in my opinion. I'm going to use a quarter ounce of amaretto or almond liqueur. And then I'm also going to use quarter ounce of bean cotto. So this is the one I got. I got this offline. Um, it's definitely not super available everywhere, but if you have an Italian specialty store, um, that's a great place to find it. And if not, it is available online. It's a little pricey because it's a small bottle, but it's really thick. I don't know if y'all can see how thick that is. Oh, wow. like, yeah, it's really thick. The cool thing about this is I'm using it for the cocktail, but this is amazing on anything. Just grill up a fish fillet, drizzle this on there, make a salad, <laughs> dressing, do this ice cream, this, like this will become your new favorite ingredient. I promise. <laughs> uh, I love that you're the Vincoto ambassador. This is great. <laughs> We're the whole category. It is. There's actually one of my colleagues in Italy makes a liqueur from the Vincoto. So he calls it Mosto Cotto, which is cooked must, same, same. Mm -hmm. uh, but he turns it into a liqueur and it is gorgeous. It's really thick and like pungent and balsamic-y and fruity and grapey and strong all at the same time. It's just, it's gorgeous. Oh, I love that liqueur. I'm gonna have to get it's, some. it's one of those things. I can't get it here. This <laughs> is so I have those ingredients in my shaker before I put in my milk and my ice. I'm gonna get the rest of my stuff ready. So I have this really awesome vintage coupe for my cocktail. And then I have a couple ingredients for my garnishing. 
I'm going to have those set up here. Please forget the absolute disaster of a bar station right now. <laughs> um, but we're going to add an ounce of the scalded milk. And then I'm going to ice up my shaker. And I'm going to shake it for about 10 seconds, give or take. It's nothing crazy. All right. And I like to prepare my garnish first because I have this whole thing of prosciutto here. <laughs> and I'm going to grate some dark chocolate over it. Mm. And then a little orange zest. And I'm doing this separate from the glass just so that it stays on the prosciutto and not floating on top of my cocktail. So now I'm going to double strain the cocktail. I have my Hawthorne strainer here, my fine mesh strainer here. And believe it or not, when you taste this, it's like a really amazing adult hot chocolate, or not hot chocolate, um, like chocolate milk or yoohoo. Mm. It reminds me of like a boozy yoohoo. I don't know why, but it does. All right, so I've got that there, and then I'm going to give it a little spritz of Averna, and this is to just add a little more depth of flavor, because again, this was originally a dessert thickened with pig's blood, which is a very rich flavor profile, if you've ever had something like blood sausage, stuff like that. So this is a really big spritzer. If you had like an atomizer, definitely use like small spritz. <laughs> and then prosciutto, and that is the quid pro quo. That looks that delicious. Looks delicious. <laughs> Man, I'm just over here. I got no dessert. I got no cocktails. I got nothing. Yeah, I mean, you're over there with sad donuts. I'm over here with prosciutto. <laughs> I think I think I win in this particular. Yeah, you part. definitely won on many levels today. <laughs> but yeah, that's all I have for you guys today. Um, I do have a hotline, is what I like to call it. Um, anytime anyone takes a class with me in real life or virtually. You have access to the hotline at all times. I do post new cocktail recipes every single week on the Pandemic Pen Up Instagram account. The Underground Cooking Club is my little company page on Facebook. Um, I do a lot of the base recipes for the cocktails, like the infusions and the syrups and the juice blends that I make. And I live stream free classes every Sunday at 5 with the cocktails that I'm creating. And then um, all the archives or all the videos that I have made through the pandemic and before are on my YouTube channel. There's some cooking ones on there. There's a lot more cocktail ones on there because that's been my focus <laughs> throughout the pandemic. But feel free to reach out to me with any questions, suggestions, or challenges. I'm here for it. Chandler, this is amazing. I am so excited to get on my moraine making skills. Uh, I'm definitely gonna send you some updates, uh, you know, to Depending on which way it goes, you'll get updates. If it doesn't go well, you're not getting updates. No, if it doesn't go well, send them to me. I need some comedians. <laughs> yeah. um, but everybody, thanks for joining. Um, if you haven't already, get yourself a timer. Um, you set up a timer for, for Sunday to, to tune in to some of these uh, classes that Chandler's doing. Um, I just want to say uh, thank you to everyone who's joined in this year. I know this year has been wild and crazy and is still not over with yet. But, um, you know, thanks to Portland Cocktail Week and Distance Learning, we've had some opportunity to, to share some time with some friends and also to learn a little bit. I think that's the the best part of, of this whole thing is the opportunity to do that. Um, there are so many talented people in our industry that do so many amazing things. And this gives us um, just a little bit of insight into that. So thanks for joining. Um, please check us out, um, Campari Academy especially. Um, we're always coming up with new fun ways to do education just like this. Um, and Chandler, thank you. This has been amazing. You put a lot of work into this. And this it, is so much fun. Thank you so much for having me. This is a much better Tuesday than I've had in a very long time. <laughs> uh, it's been a great Tuesday for me too. So thank you very much. All right. I'll All right. see you when I see you. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining.